So welcome to the third episode of What is Non-Duality? In the first two episodes, I talked about the possibility of seeing that there is emptiness, or we could say seeing that the self is empty, and seeing that there is fullness, or we could say that seeing that everything is filled with unconditional love. Today, I want to talk about free will and choice. For most of us, as we grow up, we grow up with the impression of separation, that we are individuals, that we are people living in an external world. And that experience has certain characteristics. And two of these characteristics are that we tend to learn that we have these rather precious commodities called free will and choice. In other words, I can make choices about how I behave in the world, and those choices will help to construct something called my life. And I can make these choices because I have this very precious commodity uh, called free will. Um, in many philosophies and in religions and in spiritual paths, this is held to be, in a sense, the, you know, the keystone upon which everything else is built, the keystone upon which this thing called my life is built. And um, I am responsible for that life. And through my free will and choices, I am responsible for whether it goes well or badly. One of the most challenging things about non-duality, one of the most challenging things which is seen when emptiness and fullness is seen is that because the self is an illusion, because the self does not actually exist, free will and choice also collapse because there is, after all, no one here, and I'm pointing again very deliberately at where there may seem to be a self, there is no one here who can exercise free will and make decisions about something called their life and their future. Now, this is a great challenge to people because most of our values, um, our sense of morality, uh, many of our beliefs about the world and why the world is meaningful uh, are based on this kind of this central foundation stone, you know, the foundation stone that because I am a separate individual, I can choose how I operate in the world um, and I can make decisions and I will experience the consequences of those decisions for good or bad. So what is being said here is that so far everything I've been talking about in this episode is, um, is an illusion, is a kind, if you like, is a kind of error, a kind of divine error. And again, this is part of the shock. If it's seen even just for a split second, that what is sitting here, which seems to be so solid, which seems to be an individual, which seems to be a person, is um, actually, we could just say, um, an emptiness manifesting itself as sound, as experience, as seeing, as hearing, as talking. So that sense that uh, apprehension, that realization that um, the self does not exist and therefore free will does not exist. It can leave uh, the one who seems to be here in um, a real state of shock when this is first seen. In a way, the collapse of that sense of self and the sense of free will also makes all the meaningful stories about the world that I might have grown up with, that I might be telling myself, through which I might feel that life is meaningful. It makes all of these stories collapse. Uh, I've spoken before about how sometimes an initial seeing 
through the existence of the self can lead the the character i'm going to call it can leave the character in a state of uh, despair and what i've been talking about so far up to now today partly accounts for that because the one who believed that they had a life which they could lead the one who believed that they could lead that life well or badly through the choices that they made and who could experience good consequences or perhaps bad consequences through the choices that they made that that one that person simply doesn't exist so none of the choices which I apparently made were real choices arising from something called my own will. Now this can be very shocking. On the other hand, it can also be very relieving. And this is why sometimes one of the things that's reported when non-duality is seen is a um, collapse in the sense of guilt about past actions and a collapse in the sense of responsibility and perhaps therefore a kind of an increase in a sense of freedom i want to make a sound now it's like an exhalation of breath it's a sort of ah uh, it's a sort of exhalation of breath of relaxation and relief and one of the things that people report is that even just with a split second of seeing of emptiness it's like the grip the firm iron grip of the past that has on so many of us that grip can at the very least loosen and perhaps that grip can release entirely as it's realized that I, again, pointing to what appears to be a person, that I never made any choices about the world, again, pointing out there at what seems to be the external world. I never made any choices about the world. I never made any decisions which had good consequences or bad consequences. There was certainly the appearance of choice. There was certainly the feeling or the sensation of choice. There was certainly the experiencing of decisions which seem to be the results of those choices. But in the seeing that this, this is empty, all of that simply collapses. There was never anyone who made a choice. There was never anyone who came to a decision there was never anyone who caused things to happen good things to be proud of or to be pleased with or bad things to feel guilty about or to feel remorse about i'm going to talk on a different occasion about how the sense of time um, and indeed space uh, changes immensely in awakening in the the seeing of non-duality but for now i want to focus on that kind of release and relief from the immense burden that we may be carrying called the consequences of the things that i have done and particularly the consequences of in inverted commas here, air quotations, the mistakes which I may have made. Many of us go through life with an acute sense of the burden of our past and an acute sense of guilt weighing us down. These are parts of the gift I'm using that word a little bit ironically, the gift that comes when we feel we have conferred on us, you know, the honour of being a person who has free will. You know, the other side of that is that I have to bear the consequences and the feeling that, you know, I have exercised that free will sometimes in unwise, perhaps in destructive ways. So when we hear people talking about the 
um, freedom that is there when non-duality is seen. Uh, this is partly what this is about. It's like we have finally laid down a great burden, the burden of free will and guilt. I spoke a little bit carelessly there. Of course, we haven't laid down that burden because we do not exist, so we are unable to do that. But nevertheless, that may be the sense, a sense of increased freedom as I realize that the weight of my past experience no longer has to be carried because there was never anyone there. In this case, there was never a Richard who made decisions which had consequences, which I might now feel bad about. So it's one of the most fundamental things about this, and it's one of the most challenging things about this. It's a challenge. I'm hesitating because uh, the word challenge is inadequate, but I shall use it for now. It is a challenge to every story of morality that I might ever have entertained, that I might ever have been taught, that I might ever have been offered by the adults around me as I was growing up, whether they may have been well-meaning parents or whether they may have been well-meaning, perhaps not such well-meaning religious figures, priests, moralists of any kind. So in a sense, what we're talking about here in the seeing that free will collapses, we're talking about the collapse of morality and moralism. And I'm using both those words and I'm using them quite carefully. I'm well aware that for the ordinary mind, when they hear that, the instantaneous thought is the, uh, it may, may be, not necessarily will be, but very often it is. And the challenge comes, uh, oh, well, without, without morality, then there's just anarchy. Then we may, we might as well all go out and murder each other in the streets. But the point I'm making is that the story of morality was always false. It was always a false story that we always do, we always have done, we always will do, apparently, what happens, what arises. And of course, in each of us, there is a character. Here, there is a character. There, there will be a character. And that character will, as it were, act itself out on the world. I was talking about this uh, at a meeting uh, many years ago, and there was um, a young woman um, sitting in the front row, and she became a little horrified at what I was saying when I was talking about the uh, seeing through of free will and choice and therefore of morality. And she said in a slightly outraged turn, well, if what you're saying is right, Richard, then I might as well go out and start murdering people on the street. And this is the kind of uh, response that we may get to what's being said here um, when things have not been thought through too clearly. I mean, the fact is that what was stopping that young lady from going out and murdering people on the street was, you know, not that there was some kind of morality that she had been taught when she was growing up, that this is really quite a bad thing to do. What was stopping her from going out and murdering people on the street was you know, quite obvious that sitting there was not the character of a murderer. So um, the psychopath who may indeed act in that way is not going to be prevented from it by any story of morality. And equally, for those of us, the 
I'm very glad to say the vast majority of us who do not go out onto the streets and at random murder people, what is stopping us is not simply a story of morality. What is stopping us is that there is not that character there. So there is no need whatsoever to concern ourselves that if the realization that there is no free will takes hold amongst a great many people, this is in fact going to cause some kind of um, massive outbreak of very, very bad behavior. I won't go into this in any detail here, but I will just mention it in passing because it is kind of relevant. But if, you know, there are arguments that might suggest that it is precisely our beliefs in morality, our very fixed beliefs that actually make many of us behave perhaps in you know, rather negative ways. And that if those stories were seen through, then by and large, the world might be a better place. But you know, that's a that's a that's a, 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 a another topic, a more philosophical topic, and you know maybe a topic to return to in you know in another of these talks. But I think for now maybe there's a little bit of summing up due, so I will try to do that. So the suggestion from here is that when it's seen that there's no person here, it's seen that there is no one operating in something called the external world. There's no one making decisions about how they act in the external world. And when that's seen, it's realized that uh, free will and ideas of morality simply have no purchase. They have no foothold here. They absolutely have no foothold here. This is one of the reasons it's so difficult to map what's being said here about non-duality. It's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to map that onto religions, uh, moral philosophies, and spiritual paths. Spiritual paths and religions tend to be awash with moralities. They tend to be awash with, in other words, oughts and shoulds and musts. So the religious speaker and the religious teacher, the spiritual speaker and the spiritual teacher and the moral philosopher will almost certainly not be able to resist the temptation of telling you, 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 how you should act, how you ought to act, how you must act, how your actions up to now may have been very naughty, and how you can reform yourselves so that your actions become better. So in other words, you know, spiritual paths, religions and moral philosophies tend to be filled to the brim with oughts, shoulds and musts. Oughts, just shoulds and musts by and large have a pretty negative effect on us. One of those negative effects is fairly obviously they tend to make us highly neurotic. The more oughts, shoulds and musts you have in your head, then the more neurotic you're likely to be. The other way around also uh, applies. The more neurotic you are, the more likely it is that you'll have many oughts, shoulds and musts in your head. Um, therapists and other um, people and teachers who've seen through this, who've seen the, uh, the negative impact on us of moralistic teachings uh, have coined the word um, uh, masturbation. So from the therapist often comes the, avoid, the advice, avoid masturbation, and of course, ought cause hardening of the arteries. So relaxation is the antidote to that. But there's no one sitting here suggesting to you that you should relax. I mean, if you wish to relax and you find ways of relaxing, that's absolutely delightful, that's absolutely wonderful. But what's being said here is not that. I'm not adding another ought here, which is the you ought to relax. 
But what I'm pointing out here is that if non-duality is seen and the sense of person is seen through, then oughts and musts and shoulds will probably drop away or radically decrease and relaxation will quite possibly radically increase of its own accord. I often quote um, a Tibetan a Buddhist um, saying, uh, relaxation is the key to Buddhahood right here, right now. But there's no suggestion here that you should be relaxing in order to become Buddhas. What that saying is about and what's being said here is simply a description. It's simply a noticing that when the self collapses and when this is seen, then relaxation tends to increase. So we could say, you know, the less the, less the self is there, the more relaxation may be there. That could be a way of putting this. So how can we leave this? How can I sum this up? Free will, choice, forget about it. Forget about it. It simply doesn't apply. It may not be the wisest decision you ever make in your life if you go into a pub or amongst a group of unknown people, of strangers, or even of friends, and announce this to them. Because few things tend to start arguments as fast as the denial of free will and choice. So maybe, you know, we should keep this a secret between ourselves or only share this or talk about this in our non-duality communities. I feel this is one of the reasons it's so lovely to be in a community of people who do have a feeling for non-duality because we can say things which, you know, in the public bar <laughs> may sound rather shocking to the people who are listening to us there. So I'm not actually saying keep this to yourself. <laughs> this is not an esoteric secret, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a great realization. It's a great realization when it comes. Free will and choice are characteristics of an individual person, of a self and no individual person exists, no self exists. So free will and choice do not exist. Okay, I shall leave it here for now and I'll see you in another episode. <laughs>